and the importance of historical study, Sunday with historian and Pulitzer Prize winner Gordon Wood on Book TV's In-Depth, live for three hours with your calls, emails, and tweets at noon Eastern on C-SPAN 2. Now a forum on the image of Muslims in the U.S., hosted by the Congressional Muslim Staff Association. Speakers include James Zogby, head of the Arab American Institute. This is about an hour and a half. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Asad Akhtar. I'm the president of the Congressional Muslim Staff Association, otherwise known as the CMSA. And we uh, welcome you to our briefing, Muslims in America, Myths and Realities. Um, we have a distinguished panel here before us to talk about what we call it a discussion on faith in the wake of the Park 51 controversy. Now, I want to be clear that this briefing is not about Park 51. None of the panelists here are, are experts on the project or connected to the project directly. This is not about Park 51, the Congressional Muslim Staff Association uh, does not take a position on the Park 51 project, nor do we uh, necessarily endorsing the positions of the panels here. The Muslim Staff Association uh, wants to bring together uh, experts and community leaders and others to talk about the conversation that's taking place in the wake of the, this controversy, the controversy, uh, conversation that's taking place all across America about faith and about where Muslim Americans stand. Uh, and it's a complex conversation that we're having right now. Uh, the Muslim Staff Association was, uh, represents all the Muslims who work on Capitol Hill in congressional offices, legislative offices, and uh, in the many support offices. When we started the CMSA more than four years ago, uh, the first event that we had was uh, in the wake of the Danish cartoon controversy that was sweeping across Europe and throughout much of the world. And we screened a documentary uh, for the Capitol Hill community of the PBS documentary, Legacy of a Prophet, about Prophet Muhammad. In order to offer some education and information to the, community, to the larger Capitol Hill community about what's going on and about who Muslims are and, the, and the, the conversation that's happening again at that time. But the one that's happening now is happening directly on our shores and as Americans. And as Muslim Americans who, who live here, who work here, grown up here, um, you know, this is something that we can innately speak about directly. And we're very uh, honored to have this distinguished panel before us to talk about uh, this larger conversation happening in America. And it's one that's complex. It's not simple. Uh, in a Time Magazine poll that was taken a few weeks ago, they asked, do you favor or oppose a mosque near Ground Zero? 26% favored, 61% opposed, and this was, widely, uh, this was widely disseminated in the public. But two, two statistics that weren't in the same poll, in that same poll, the same people uh, who said that said, would you favor or oppose a mosque in your own neighborhood? And by a 55 to 34% margin, they said they would favor a mosque in their own neighborhood, in their own communities. In the same poll, they asked, would you say that most U.S. Muslims are patriotic Americans? By 55 to 25 percent margin, more than two to one, they said yes, that most Muslim Americans are patriotic Americans. So this is not a simple conversation as the media would have us believe that this is one-sided or in one way. It's complex. And this is a conversation I think the panels can speak to that's, been hap that's happened in America many times before. Uh, Mr. Suhail Khan, who's our moderator today, uh, I'm proud to say worked on Capitol Hill and started um, the uh, Capitol Hill Jummah prayer, the Friday prayer, uh, in which every Friday Muslims uh, in, in Washington, D.C. area and from, from all parts of the country uh, come to pray under the Capitol Dome every Friday. And we've had this for, for more than a decade. And uh, we've had visitors from around the world, the State Department has brought visitors from around the world to this Friday prayer. We've had visitors from Muslim-majority countries, places where there's 90% Muslims, where they can't pray in public or, or def, certainly not in a government building, and they're amazed, and they're, they're saddened by their own plight at home. So regardless of the, the uh, adversity that we face at home, and at times it's been stifling, at times there's been violence and, and, and uh, desecration of, of mosques and opposition, but whatever adversity we face, there can be no doubt that we're blessed to be Americans and blessed to be able to practice our faith in this country. And, um, and adversity is the key. And adversity is the key because we know it's the story in faith as it is in America from the very founding of our nation that without adversity there can be no progress. 
And that progress is what we're seeking, and that's the conversation that we're seeking here today with the panel that we have assembled. So I thank you all for being here again today. I won't take up any further time. I want to introduce our moderator for this uh, conversation, Mr. Suhail Khan, who worked on Capitol Hill for, 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 uh, for, for many years and was a figure, major figure in the Bush administration, both at the White House and Department of Transportation, and is now a senior fellow at the Institute for Global Engagement. Uh, I'm proud to uh, say that I'm, I always enjoy doing events with him, not only because he's a good man, uh, but because I can say that, that we have bipartisan cooperation on anything we do. So without any further ado, Mr. Suhail Khan. Thank you. Thanks, Asad. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out this morning on this very important topic. And um, Asad very ably laid out the issues here. The uh, controversies surrounding the Park 51 Community Center in Lower Manhattan has really sparked a national debate on a host of issues beyond just the construction of a community center in Lower Manhattan. And a lot of the questions that a lot of folks have been asking themselves have kind of come to the national conversation, including what is the role of Islam in America? Who are American Muslims? What do they want? What are their aspirations and goals? And some of the even more tougher questions have begun to really surface, including what is the role of terrorism? Uh, is there a relationship to terrorism and Islam? Is, are Muslims inherently violent? These are some of the questions that were asked in the Time Magazine article from two weeks ago. And then even other questions related to the role of women in Islam. And I've seen even now what was on the fringe, perhaps just in, uh, you know, in chat rooms and on the internet, has now kind of surfaced and bubbled up, as Asad said, to the mainstream conversation, to the point where mainstream politicians are now accusing Muslims of somehow being a fifth column, somehow not being capable of being loyal as Americans, that they might have uh, inherent conflicts in their faith as far as their loyalties. And there are all kinds of accusations that are swirling around. So what we thought here is that we would assemble a panel of experts who can really take on some of these myths, challenge some of these myths, and really shed light on some of these issues that have come up. So what I thought I'd do is go ahead and introduce the panel. And they will each speak for a brief uh, 10 to 15 minutes. And then we can go right to the Q&A so we can have a a real good conversation about some of the issues that are on people's minds. And um, before we go, with that, I just want to remind folks, since we are live on uh, being taped here, that if we could uh, turn off cell phones and pagers so that we don't have any interruptions, that would be helpful. But uh, I'll introduce our panelists, if I could. Uh, our first panelist, to my, I'll go in order, um, is, uh, is uh, Salam al Mariati. Salam is the president of the MPAC, the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Uh, they have offices all over the country, including here in Washington, D.C. and in Los Angeles. Salam has been a, a champion for uh, issues related to the Muslim American community for over two decades. And uh, he resides in Los Angeles with his wife, but he's, he's a fixture here in Washington, D.C. as well in public policy forums, working with the executive branch as well as on Capitol Hill. And he will uh, discuss issues related to uh, just basic overview of the role of Muslims, their life in the United States, challenges. Are they in any way unique or different than every other day Americans? And then next up, we have Professor Aziz Al-Hebri, who is the uh, professor of law at the University of Richmond Law School. She's also the founder and chairman of Karama, a Muslim women's advocacy organization. And she will be especially uh, able to address issues related to Islam and the law. We have a lot of questions and myths related to Sharia uh, and questions related to Sharia. Uh, I always say that um, you know, Sharia is like when you're a kid and you kind of learn a dirty word and you keep going on re wanting to repeat it. About five, six years ago, the word related to Islam that a lot of people want to repeat was the word Wahhabism. And you heard that all the time. Everybody was a Wahhabi. I had to look it up when I was accused of being a Wahhabi. Uh, and now the new dirty word is Sharia. And uh, I thought Professor uh, al Hibri could address some of the issues and some of the questions related to Sharia, what exactly that is, and do Muslims in fact want to impose Sharia upon everybody else. And last up, our speaker is Dr. Jim Zogby, the uh, founder and president of the Arab American Institute, who really has been a pioneer. If, if Salam's been working for 20 years, Jim's been working for over 30 in the trenches, really trying to empower Americans of all backgrounds and faiths, but particularly in the Arab American community, uh, he's uh, unique in that he's uh, Arab American, but also Irish, also Catholic. So he's seen this movie before, as it were. And I thought he might be able to provide a historical context of some of the challenges we're facing right now. 
But with that, let me start with Salam and we'll proceed down. Thank you and good morning. Well, uh, I'm going to be talking about the Muslim American community and, and Islam, but I'm going to try to tie it into the Park 51 controversy uh, because I know there are a lot of questions that arise from that issue. And uh, first and foremost is this, uh, the, the nomenclature of this uh, uh, particular controversy. It started out as the Ground Zero Moth controversy. And I think by, by now everybody acknowledges that the place is not at Ground Zero and it is not a mosque. Uh, it, it is uh, a few blocks away where you can't even see Ground Zero, and uh, it is a community center that was actually intended to develop interfaith understanding. And I think that's important because a lot of Muslim American institutions now uh, are doing exactly that. They're reaching out to their fellow neighbors, to Christians and Jews in their local communities, uh, and developing interfaith understanding and tackling issues such as poverty, homelessness, any kind of injustice. Uh, and trying to develop better dialogue among uh, the, the three Abrahamic faiths, as Islam, Christianity, and Judaism uh, are all rooted in uh, Abraham as really the, the father uh, of these three great religions. Um, but the fact is that it was called the Ground Zero Mosque, and that obviously caused a lot of consternation. Um, and here we have to distinguish between truth and fact. Uh, the truth is it's not on ground zero, it's not a mosque, it's a community center. Uh, and the fact is it was called that, so as you repeat the facts, uh, it becomes reality, and we have to deal with these realities. Now, moving away from this controversy, you see demonstrations against mosques and Muslims throughout the country. And I think the one issue that we have to be very concerned about uh, as Americans is the burn of the burning the Quran day um, on 9/11, uh, in particular, uh, in, uh, particularly in Gainesville, Florida, where there will be a, pre, uh, a reverend, a religious uh, Christian religious leader, who will sponsor burning the the Quran day, uh, and this is a, obviously a, a major issue for us. But as Muslims, we have told our congregations told Muslim Americans, ignore that, keep doing your good work because this is what the Quran tells us to do. Uh, but as Americans, we should be very concerned about that because first and foremost, I think people need to understand that what is the Quran. The Quran basically is a, um, what Muslims consider a revelation from God, just as Jesus is the word of God uh, that Muslims believe in. Uh, Muhammad was given this revelation that was basically uh, compiled into the Quran today. And within the Quran, there are stories about Abraham, about Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob, about Moses and the children of Israel. We read during Ramadan, the Quran, uh, quite extensively about the struggle of the children of Israel against the pharaohs and against uh, the tyranny and the injustice there and how they were liberated. We read about Jesus and his mother, Mary. So really the biblical prophets are also Islam's prophets. And I don't think many Americans are aware uh, of that. And we take responsibility of, as Muslims of not presenting that kind of information uh, to people. So we have, uh, as a result, this burning the, the Quran day. And what we are telling Muslims, uh, number one, to ignore, and number two, if somebody's burning anything in your neighborhood, the first thing you do is call the fire department because that's a fire hazard. Um, uh, but obviously, the images of that cause even greater problems for us as Americans because could you imagine now in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, images of Americans burning the Quran? How now that is propaganda and recruiting material for Al Qaeda and other violent extremists. And here's an important point for us to make then that. Anti-Muslim sentiment is in America is basically a mirror of anti-American sentiment on the global arena. So as anti-Muslim sentiment spikes here in America, then you can expect a spike of anti-American sentiment 
abroad, and now we, we see several counterterrorism uh, experts talking about how this is really undermining our efforts uh, throughout the world and putting more Americans in harm's way. Uh, and I think this issue of Islamophobia then has to be viewed as an American problem, not just as a Muslim problem. Now, Pew uh, has conducted